Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. This regular program here is sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which offers innovative and compassionate care. They have residents, uh, they do memory care right now, and they're looking at building uh, assisted living and independent care also on Rolling Bay. They offer day stay and respite programs today. To learn more, jot this number down, 360-689-4314. Also, I like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, this Coast Salish tribe, which is our nearest neighbor to the north, people of the clear salt water. We honor them and we are grateful for their hospitality. We are also very grateful to Akuye, Karen Vargas, and Debbie Hase, who are with us today. Uh, we're going to talk about truth and reconciliation. And uh, to get us started, uh, our uh, good friend and board member, Anne Lovejoy. Thanks, Reed, and thank you again very much, Akuye and Debbie, for joining us. You two have such rich, amazing skills and backgrounds that I really love being able to have conversations with you because I always learn so much. But if we start off, I think it'd be really helpful for people if you could talk a little about what is the Truth and Reconciliation Movement. I'm aware of it as a, on a national basis, but not so much kind of locally. So. Would either one of you want to kind of sketch that out for us a little bit? Akuye? You're muted. I think they're waiting for the other oh. person. Akuye, go ahead, please. Yes. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody. How's everybody doing? Great. That's great. It's great to see everybody. Well, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, movement has been going on for quite a while with, you know, Bishop Desmond Tutu, you know, um, those national leaders, the Dalai Lama, um, you know, it goes way back. Um, and it's really about um, healing and making peace and being able to work through conflict and being able to resolve atrocities that have happened within our nations, within our communities, with uh, um, different cultures. And so, you know, that movement began many years, uh, I believe, even before I was born. And so, you know, um, the, the need to heal and the need to be peacemakers um, goes back for thousands of years. This is not a new movement. This movement has been going on for centuries from time immemorial. And so as we begin to talk about it, we have to set a tone. You know, it's not a brand new movement. This, this is a call to humanity to be able to help one another process through difficult, challenging situations that have transpired and have been, we've been immersed or, or been a part of atrocities and all of these different things to be able to move humanity into a place of how do you heal those atrocities? How do you begin to make peace after there's been so much war and conflict and all of these things? And so, you know, the conversation has to come continue and not only continue, but we have to cultivate that type of culture that we move towards a place of health and wellness, a place of, of reconciling, a place of healing, a place of restoration and restoring man back to humanity. And so. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Um, and Debbie, I know the two of you went recently to talk to our county commissioners about the idea of a truth and reconciliation proclamation for uh, the county and got some interesting questions back. Do you want to, can you say a little about that or both of you? Sure. You want me to go, Okuye? Yeah, Debbie, come on in here. Have this yeah. conversation. I just, so uh, first I have to say, wow, the way you like encapsulate that all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm going to like re listen to this recording over and over, even though I've heard you before that was, eh, thank you. Exactly. Anyhow. Um, yeah, uh, so 
a little bit, I guess, bringing it on home more. That was a big jump from what Akuye said to meeting with the county commissioners. Um, so Akuye has convened, you know, a couple of years ago, convened the coalition Kitsepi E-Race Coalition, Equity, Race, and Community Engagement. And that coalition of about 60 some organizations has six teams. And one of the teams in there is Breaking Bread for Racial Justice, um, which is comprised of mostly faith leaders and people of um, spirit background, I guess. I don't know how else to say that. Um, and that team is initiating a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Kitsap County. Do you want to add anything more to that little background before we go into the commissioner meeting? Oh, no, that was perfect. That good? Um, so um, one of the pastors, Susie Beal, she initiated, a, along with Akuye, a meeting with the three county commissioners last week. And the, the three of us then they asked for another volunteer, and I went too. So, um, so we got to meet with all three county commissioners. They had already seen a letter that was published asking for this Truth and Reconciliation Commission to happen in the county. And um, I mean, we had a half an hour with them, so that's not a lot of time. And it was clear that there wasn't anything allocated for this in the budget yet um, for this upcoming year. But we got to talk about, you know, there were questions about, well, this is all on the national level. Like what, what might it look like more on a, a local level? And are there any examples of commissions that have happened that weren't, you know, within a nation like South Africa or Canada, where those commissions are more well known? Um, and and so we just gave a few examples of that that we are, you know, that we were aware of. And then there's also an example in our county, the um, in Indianola with the Suquamish tribe. Anyhow, so we had some conversations about that. They also were curious who would make up the commission, who would, you know, be comprised. And and of course, that's not something we could answer because it's it's really um, in in the making yet, and how to how to be inclusive, and. There, there was a question about what kind of credentials and um, the Kuye let them know that really it's not all about degrees and particular cred credentials, that that may be more of a, that is more of a um, colonizer Western way of looking at things that we have to also look at people's lived experience. And sometimes we as white body people forget that um, or don't know that. And so that was really helpful for Akuye to offer that, that generous learning um, to the commissioners. And what else do we talk about here? I'm kind of going through notes, just I don't want to go through all the details, but um, we got to, you know, explain examples that have happened, that are happening or have happened in our county, like the Port Madison dialogues that the commissioners and the Suquamish tribe offered about a year ago. And um, of course, the Japanese Exclusion Memorial is an example of rec truth and reconciliation that's happened right here on Bainbridge Island. And also how the Kitsap Human Rights Council got started after some cross burnings in the county. And so, you know, kind of bringing it on home, you know, talking about how truth and reconciliation commissions that have been more successful are not only top down or only bottoms up that it's really community and government working together for a uh, commission to be um, a little more effective or a lot more effective, maybe, I don't know. Um, and um, it was, I guess I felt like they listened. Uh, maybe Akuya, they listened, were receptive um, when asked what, why they'd wanna have this commission. Um, one of the answers was, because it's the right thing to do and we serve the community. So that's my quick report back, Akuye. What do you have to add? You know, I was so thankful and grateful um, for us to even begin the conversation 
because that is the beginning of moving things forward, connecting and sitting down and hearing and listening to one another and being able to share concerns and being able to talk about how do we begin to do this work as we move forward. You know, I, I welcome their question because they, they said, well, how are you going to do this and how are you going to do that? And one of the things I said, we don't have to start from ground zero. We've got many models across across the globe that we can be able to glean from and learn from and, and make it fit our community and our county for the needs and for the things that are happening here. But, you know, when they begin to say, you know, well, what do you have? And I just throw this big old, you know, packet on their desk and said, you know, here it is, you know, take time to learn, you know, take the time to do your own research as well to be able to learn how, how, and what is going on across the world around truth and reconciliation. And I shared with them, I went all the way to Israel. I went all the way to Rome to be able to see what models were being used. I said, and I did that on my own. I said that wasn't anything that the that the county sent me to do or or put it for me to do because this is vital this is important because I told them that it's not if these things will happen but when they happen what do we have in place that can help heal our communities I said what if we had a truth and reconciliation commission already in place when the murder of stone child happened and to be able to move that entire community and our entire county in a place of healing what will happen we had a, a murder with our young people and a stabbing what would have been to be able to bring our students and our school districts and everyone into that place of, of, of reconciling and restoring our community? What happens even in our own families? This is a model for our own family when there's conflict in our own families. How do we move towards a place of healing? It's not just an isolated or just a county or just a state because I did hear in some of their concerns well, what role does the commissioners or the government play in this? And I said, all of us play a role in this. Yeah, Our that parents, is exactly right. All of us. Yes, because if we, if we don't, it's just a concept, right? But bringing it home, bringing it to our communities, bringing it to our schools um, and our families, I think those are the pieces that, you know, are gonna bring it to life. And having a commission, would give us a framework. I think that's part of it. And a, and a place for grassroots groups to coordinate, right? <laughs> Debbie, you want to comment on that grassroots thing? Oh, yeah, I really do. Go ahead. I, go um, ahead. We had, um, in preparing, we had read Rob Gelder's um, website. And in the web, on his website, he's, he has, I'm pretty sure this is, quote, working with people on grassroots level to understand hopes, concerns, and visions for what our community can be. And um, so at the end, Akuye brought that back, um, brought that around. And when they were asking, so what are you really asking for? What are the actions? And she's like, she quoted this and said, this is the vision the community is asking for. And this is as grassroots as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and uh, Commissioner Gelder is like, okay, yeah, yeah, it was. So uh, one of the commissioners is stepping down in a couple of weeks, right? Yes. So will the you know this will still move forward? Do you feel like there's still going to be some energy behind it? Should we participate? What What do you need? We need all of us to be able to continue to call our our community, our city leaders into um, the health and wellness of all of us. They, um, they serve the community and we just want them to be a part of how do we move things forward in a healthy way. And we need 
our our city officials and leaders to to be a part they need to 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 be allies in this work and they they need to be having these conversations right alongside with us and and being able to to hear the concerns of those they serve those that they serve and so we want to be able to to continually go back and say, can we meet again? Where are we in this process? And continue to move it forward. I don't think this is a one and done type of thing. We have to continue to cultivate, you know, how we will move forward to do this work. You know, one of the things that I was I was really happy about is, is the things that's happening in our own community on Bainbridge, even with our Martin Luther King uh, programming, our Black history programming, our, our Pacific Island, all of these things in culmination. How do we build the beloved community? And, you know, Years ago, when and I don't know if you can see it, and, and I know it's backwards, yeah. but it is no, it's good. it is a guide that our students, our students back in 2011 went to do training with Bishop Desmond Tutu in Minnesota, their national youth leadership on peacemaking and what it means to build a beloved community. Mm -hmm. And so when Bishop Desmond Tutu passed away at the beginning of 22, we said, you know what, our initiative for this year is going to be truth and reconciliation in honor of all his life that he gave for peacemaking and for truth and reconciliation and honor that work. How do we begin to stand on the shoulders of those that have given their lives for the embitterment of humanity? And then how do we help the next generation step into moving those things forward for them and for their children and for the future? And so we have to cultivate that type uh, of, of movement when we say we we want the best for for humanity or we want the best for our community or we want the best for our schools and we want the best for all you know all of the above but that means you have to be intentional about cultivating that it's not going to be poof out the air osmosis and those things like that you have to be a yeah you have to be able to see the work, cultivate the work, even prune the work when it gets to get out of control, you know, and because you have to understand that this is a lifelong process. This isn't that one and done hit and, you know, and go on and, and those things that that all of us want the best for our children, for our families, for our loved ones, for our community. And that takes work, y'all. It does. And I have a question here that I was thinking too, what kind of expertise is needed to facilitate root truth and reconciliation? And does this relate to dispute resolution? Mm -hmm. And both of you, um, Debbie and Akuye, have some serious background in peacemaking and I always say both of you are incredibly skillful at turning arguments into conversations. And that seems like one of the skill skills that we could cultivate. Um, I'm thinking about Debbie, your work in, um, uh, help me. Compassionate, <laughs> compassionate listening. listening. Um, sort of, yeah. Compassionate listening. Thank you. Um, Cause I always think of nonviolent communication but it's very similar, but it's a little bit different, right? Uh, but those kinds of skill training sessions could be super helpful. Or do you think that is practical? Well, okay. I, I, I'm having, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert. You said something about expertise. <laughs> so, so I'm definitely not an expert in truth and reconciliation or anything, really. I'm just a learner. So, um, I think this is something I've been sitting with a lot. Like, what is real truth and reconciliation? Like, what, what are some qualities? If I'm just going to think about it myself after having done some research and talking to people. And there's the truth telling people talk about. But I don't think it's only about the telling, you know, or the speaking about the truth. It's 
my experience with compassionate listening and with um, facilitating compassionate listening workshops and going on delegations to say, you know, Israel and Palestine and the Alabama and in restorative circles and healing circles is like the first step is um, people truth telling, but people really, really listening and, and, and not just listening with their ears, but like really seeing the humanity in the other person. And it's like, and somehow when that happens in a group, a little bit more than one-on-one -on -one, I've experienced that there's, there, there can be a, a real shift. Like you can, I can't ever tell what's going on with somebody else, but if I'm watching their body language and what they say afterwards, after they've been deeply, deeply listened to, there's something that happens very often. And I would probably, if I was going to try to language it or name it, I would consider it in the realm of healing. And so there's that aspect. And, and so I think it's important in this whole process that people are going to listen really well and are going to have that open openness to whatever is going to be there and not like get all activated. And, and then there's the part that's in Breaking Bread, we've talked about what does reconciliation mean? And I think about it more as like, how does repair, you know, like it's not just about listening to somebody and letting it be because a lot of people, you know, I'm a white body person, so I can't speak to being to that, to the level that people experienced and communities who are marginalized. But I do hear often that we've been talking and telling our story for a really long time. So it's not just about listening to that. It's like, how are we gonna repair? How is there gonna be some restoring? So it's that aspect that seems to be missing more often in when, when, when sort of healing start, tries to happen. So, so I don't like know. That after, was, a, after a healing circle, there needs to be a next step or something like that. Or part of it. Yeah. And, and next steps, you know, like, what is that repair? What is that re restoration making it right? How do you make it right? You know, and that could be all, that's even part of an apology, you know, to say, I'm sorry. And I have mean nothing, but like, I'm sorry for like, specifically blah, 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 blah. And this is how it's going to change. And this is what I'm going to do. You know, um, that's, <laughs> I might have gotten off a little bit, but um, yeah. No, I think that's great. We have a question from Rita. I was wondering if like uh, in this very beginning here, if like for 2023, if you guys have like one specific thing that you want to accomplish, because this is such a broad thing and there's the county, there's just our city alone. And there's so many things. So I was wondering if like for a start, if there was something that was very specific so that we could, people could see some results and then go, oh, and then we, and then go, go, go from there. So that was my question. Akuya, can you speak to that? Well, we were um, on our breaking bread, um, uh, our, our meeting and uh, my, my Wi-Fi was kind of spotty, but I know they were moving into next steps. I heard some of the things. One of the things that I would love to see happen as the number one thing is to begin to have the community town halls and conversations about what that looks like for all of us in our communities, the, the community town halls about truth and reconciliation. Um, one of the things that I, um, I did say, I, and, I, and I'll continue to say, we are not exempt from trauma and tragedies happening in our communities. Um, we might just be one step away from a Columbine. We might be one step away from trauma and tragedies that might happen within our own communities. And my thing is, I don't want to be reactionary. Um, that's not a good place to be when our whole communities become volatile 
and erupt in violence or erupt with all kinds of atrocities. That's not a good place to be. What are we doing for intervention and prevention? What kind of things are we putting in place that could help us to move us quickly, quickly into healing, quickly into peacemaking, quickly into reconciling? You don't want roots of bitterness to begin to get a stronghold in the community around all of these different things. I, I, I often refer back to a whole nation in Germany that had to go through the process of truth and reconciliation because of the atrocities that happened there. And we need to look at this. We, we should not be turning a, a blind eye to this and what would have happened during the civil rights uh, movement with things were beginning to erupt if we had quickly moved our, our nation and our communities into a place of healing and reconciliation instead of more of the embitterment and, and tucking things under the rug and, and being able, because now I still see those roots of bitterness in those places. Yeah, and it, you've worked so much with kids and, and incorporated some of these uh, these skills or the training, essentially, right, into yes. what you're working with. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, for quite a while, we've been working with national youth leadership that looks at a lot of these different issues and in globally, internationally. They, they've worked across, you know, all of those different spectrums. They've rotated their training around the nation to, you know, the East Coast, the West Coast, all over, to be able to give these tools to our young people to be able to move them into to a place of, of health and well-being, whether the training is with peacemaking, whether the training is equipping them for the disparities with youth, and, or whether it is racism. They've attacked many issues over their existence to be able to address them in a way that really equips them. And they do it through leadership, service learning and social and, and cultural competency training for those young people to be able to serve their communities and do what they call taking it back home. So they have to do initiatives in their community that addresses the need in their community to be able to move it forward in a healthy way. They've worked on initiatives like Youth Against Domestic Violence, Street Life, looking at the homeless. They've done things um, working with the Human Rights Com Conference over all of the these many years. And they 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 go in and, and they they're able to say, you know, when they come back, they have to determine the initiative they want to work on. Mm -hmm. It's not anybody that determines it for them. They give them the tools to do all the assessments. They give them tools to do the mapping. Um, I remember when they took those students to Tennessee and they mapped the homeless for a week and then they came back. And they knew, you know, where the homeless was, all the demographics, you know, where they were dumpster diving to eat, where they were going to get shelter. And they mapped them for a week and then they came back and they did their reflective charts and then they did their asset mapping and then their ally billing charts. Then they had to go home and say how they were going to address that issue in their own community. So it's not just a one and done, and and they they have to make the difference in their model, living life leadership's model, and they came up with their own model. Is nothing changes until I do. Mm -hmm. So they do that inner work, and they deal with things that they're dealing with as well. And so 
um, teen dating violence, all kinds of things, not in mama's kitchen, you know, doing drug and alcohol use and all of these different things. They've addressed, they've tackled some real serious issues in their own communities, their own youth communities as well. And so, you know, culture to culture, they were breaking down barriers between, you know, diverse communities here in Kitsap County. And they presented at the Human Rights Council. They always try to make sure that they bring it to um, those leaders. They meet with their mayors. They meet with their city council members. You know, they write letters, you know, they work down with OSPI, with the Dream Team. They were very instrumental in changing the achievement gap of students of color to the opportunity gaps. They worked down with the with their legislators and with OSPI, with the Dream Team, to help change that language and to be able to do that deep work as well. So um, I don't know what to say other than nothing will change until we come to the table and That's we address it and acknowledge it because you can't change nothing you don't want to acknowledge. <laughs> totally true. I think we have questions from Reed and Debbie. Let's take Reed. Yeah, well, what you just said there, Akuye, is exactly what I was thinking about. The truth is the... And um, truth is something that uh, relates directly to taking responsibility or taking ownership of saying no change until I change or I have to change for change to happen. And I think about a lot of the um, challenges with that. That is the hardest hump, it seems, for to get over when we're having discussions like the stamp discussions we're having or what kind of curriculum we're having in our schools. Or, you know, I know there was a lot of, of uh, tension in this community when uh, the Japanese American exclusion education started to show up in our schools. Uh, it was it was really controversial. It now seems a lot less controversial than it did a few years ago. But uh, but maybe that's part of the story. And I think that you know the the talks we're having about stamped, sort of looking at the history that wasn't told about African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I mean there there's resistance to the idea that that's that that's like. Uh, that's indoctrination, I think, is the way that Jason Reynolds put it, um, the author, one of the authors of Stamped. But it's like there's been a lot of indoctrination going on, and we have to kind of see it for what it is. And that's really, really hard when we've kind of um, built our lives on the stories that um, that we that we aren't didn't have anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, maybe to you, it feels like it didn't have anything to do with you. And so that's, uh, that's a challenge to try to learn that. And I guess what you were saying about those kids going and working in those communities, making contact is the first step to recognizing the truth. But I see that as a real hurdle. And when we're looking at truth and reconciliation in our county, um, turning that uh, conflict into conversation, as Anne was saying earlier, is no, no small step. That seems like a real challenge to me. So I don't know if either of you have any comment about that. Maybe we can hear from Debbie. Well, what I'm hearing you both bring up is acknowledgement, how important genuine acknowledgement is. Um, and I think that that takes us coming together. And like you mentioned, seeing each other as human beings, you know, seeing each other. One, the reason I had my hand up too is I want to acknowledge the Dispute Resolution Center that was brought up maybe a little earlier. And at the Dispute Resolution Center, besides, and you probably all know this, I don't know, but they do, there's the restorative circles. And you were, the question was asked around youth too. And um, some of some circles that are happening are in the schools, like China Cooper does, it does uh, restorative circles in central Kitsap. And the dispute resolution, they used to call it theft prevention circle, restorative circle for, for youth who have uh, committed a crime where the community comes together to really repair, you know, and their parents and so I think often police officers. 
And, and so some of that is happening as well as um, a program called the reentry program, which is restore, restorative circles with the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe. But so this came up in our talk with the commissioners too, you know, like, oh, this is already happening, which is great. This is happening, but the restorative practices are really, you know, which, which really have come from the indigenous practices um, are really important, but we are doing some of it, but it's like, we could like, as Kuya, I heard her say, we could be taking this so much farther because things are like, some of the tools exist. We're in those circles as you were like sort of alluding to read, there's, there is the acknowledgement of what's happening and you can hear everyone's voice. And then there's even some next steps a lot of the time. Um, so that's, I just, and I really want to acknowledge the, how Kitsap County has, has really stepped into that, how the dispute resolution center has already. Thank you. Jana, did you wanna say something about truth? Heck yeah. Um, I think uh, I've been listening a lot to um, the pushback in school boards across the country. Um, and uh, I think that sometimes we don't want to, we don't want to know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know, and we really don't want to know it. And um, I think that's true for uh, lots of white folks in this country. And um, I, I think the key about truth and reconciliation is that there is no, it's kind of like the no peace without justice. You know, um, you can say you want me to be peaceful or you can say you want me to reconcile, but if we can't talk about what's really behind us and what's really in front of us, then peace and re reconciliation can't happen. So, um, so yeah, I appreciate, you know, those of you who brought up the stamped stuff. Uh, I have, you know, for me reading stamped was history that was never taught when I was a kid. And I think a lot of us can say that, um, especially uh, white people going to predominantly white schools in our country. Um, and it's, um, it's history that's really important. And if we can know that history and that truth, it makes things a lot more clear. So Thank I appreciate you. that. Yeah. Akuye, do you have something to add to that? You know, one of the things that that, you know, I always say is that we have to work in our weas. And if we're not working in our weas, which means it is our responsibility to address these issues. We have to do this work. We have to do this work. And it's going to take all of us, our we, us, to be able to begin to transform and shift the paradigm around all of these issues. I need our educators on board. I need our parents on board. I need our city government on board. I need our, you know, all of the above, because it's going to take all of our, all of us to even shift that paradigm. And so when I see us coming to the table and start positioning ourselves for, um, you know, and, and jockeying and all those things, we have missed it. Because the barriers and the division is what has caused us to operate the way we do. What we need to do is cultivate how to do collective work. That is the foundational principles to shifting this work. But then you got egos and then you, you know, you, you, you know, you got these behaviors that begins to, to shift and, and divide and splinter 
when we know where there's unity, there's strength. And we have to cultivate the collective work that needs to be done. That's base building to change and shift the paradigm. If we cannot strengthen the base building, then the foundation will crumble. And so let's focus. The focus shouldn't be all that you're doing this and I'm doing that. The shift is how do we have a healthy relationship? How strong is the, is the net working? Is the net strong? Are there holes in the net? We're the net. And if the a piece, if, if that net needs mending, we need to just stop, slow our roll and mend the net. And the net is our relationships, how we work with one another. And so if our relationship is, is going like this, then we need to stop and come back and bring it back together so we can continue to work because nothing, I'll say it like this, which is hurting the work if we can't do that because it's going to take all of us. We are the ones that's actually hurting the work of shifting these things to move forward because where you go, you go. We bring ourselves to this work. And if we're not healthy coming to this work, then we need to heal. And so we've got a lot of work to do with ourselves, as well as doing the collective thing. We've got to we got to come to the table and talk about our stuff. Why me and Ann can't work together? <laughs> I don't I thought we weren't going to talk about that. Oh, oh Ann, you know we need to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's exactly right. I mean, we've had that kind of conversation many times, like we have to be able to talk, right? And if yeah. we can't talk, we can't work. And if we can't work, we can't move. So you know. Marianne, you got a question or comment. So I am thinking about the word best. And I find that best is only a moment in time. It doesn't really, like we get older, we have problems. And I really think that we, when we try to strive for the best, we are talking about a competitive society. And I think we need a cooperative society. And one of the, um, the metaphors people use is um, for racism is that we're on a lifeboat and only so many people can be on the lifeboat. So we're going to throw people off. And I think that it's part of the indoctrination that we get that in a competitive society, we can't embrace the diversity and see in the diversity our strength. And I think about COVID, night, um, COVID and how really because we were an unequal society, we did really poorly. That is sadly so true. You could, nothing brought forward the divisions more than the last few years. And that polarization has just been so crippling for us. Debbie, can you say a little about uh, moving forward the we us part? Yeah, I love I love what uh, Kuye when you when you remind us about that. Um, well, I think in the last few years. I mean, I love working in groups and circles and I've done that pretty much most of my life. And I think I've learned more about cultivating the collective in the last couple of years in, in Kitsapi Race Coalition in this type of work. I mean, it's, and so when Akuye, when you talk about cultivating mm -hmm. the collective, it really is a practice, you know, the cultivating is like a practice. It doesn't just happen. And you have to kind of keep doing it and working at it. And that, that's cultivating those relationships. And, and I know for me as a white body person conditioned in this culture of white supremacy culture, I've been conditioned to work as an individual 
and like do my own thing or try to lead something. And, and so it's hard work dismantling, if you will, or undoing my own sense of how I work in, in that kind in, in, in a culture that values that individualism so much. And so, so I'm just like relating to what you were talking about, Akuye, and that cultivating the collective and how, like when you work with the students, it starts from within. Well, for me, it's like constantly from within to try to work within internally so that I can try to show up for the collective um, deconstructing our cultural myths. Yeah, exactly. I saw. And so that's that's sort of what I'm reflecting on in how important that is. And the experiences when I do have in working in groups and in circles and healing circles, it's like this, the synergy that happens, you know, when you come together and you have a common intention and you're, and, and things are like, like held in a space where you can, it, there's, there's something that happens when multiple people come together that you, that it's way beyond you know, um, the one plus one plus one plus makes three, it's like a thousand, you know? So it's, it's creating that synergy, allowing for that synergy within ourselves and that, that collective to, to just blossom and, and it, you know, it's real and it happens and we can do it. <laughs> so. Which is very hopeful. Oh. Mm -hmm. I think, and to me, you know, these in a small way, these community, these conversations, which do, you know, get viewed and passed around. And by the way, you'll all get the link um, and you're welcome to pass them on to other people. But these conversations are hopefully cracks in that, uh, the myth that, you know, we don't need to do this work. We totally need to do this work. Yes. And I feel like every time we get a little further and a little more open, we start to see how we can engage ourselves. Um, I, I'm hearing that more and more like, oh, actually I can do that part or that doesn't sound so bad. Or, you know, and ho I'm really hoping that our book clubs, um, stamped book yes. clubs are going to be um, really healing aspects on that. And as Reed said, how good it feels when we do the work and we see, as Rita said, you see some result from it. Those things are really rewarding in themselves. Um, and I just, I grew up in New England where not talking was a big practice. Like you didn't talk about hardly anything, um, but you know, and you'd get the look. Really darling, that's so inappropriate, but right. But if you, you know, opening those doors, I was always in trouble because I was always the one saying, well, what about, you know, but I feel like now that's our task is like to, to bring these conversations forward, to engage in them everywhere in the grocery store, yeah. everywhere, right? Yeah all the time and making them normalizing them is one huge key to helping other people say oh you mean you can talk about that now yes, yes. yeah we can right and you know akuya you are such a magical person in that way that you have the most engaging manner of anyone i know and that it, you know you do that deep listening but with such heart and i feel like that's a big piece too we haven't really talked about that exactly but I think coming at it with this loving heart yeah. is really important because so much of the challenging crap that's going on these days is heartless, right? It really doesn't have the spirit and heart piece to it. And yes. even some of our very well-intentioned conversations are kind of formal and not very yes. hurtful. Is that a word? Yes. <laughs> I don't even know. But I, Akuya, I see you nodding. Do you want to jump in on that? You know, and I'm so glad that you're saying that, you know, this has been a lifelong journey. You know, you just don't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, it. we learn through life and then we make our choices of how we will deal with stuff and how we'll move forward. And one of the things that I have uh, I have decided because you do have to make a decision. You have to make a decision how you're going to behave mm -hmm. and how you're going to act. And you've got to decide what type of character do you really want to have. And one of the things I, I always say, you know, 
attitude check with my students because when I say attitude check, they know they have to check their attitude, they got to check their behavior, and they got to check their character. What are you doing? Because whatever it is, I need you to do some reflection and go check yourself because you get ready to wreck yourself over here with that bad behavior that you're, you're that's manifesting that's affecting our whole team here and so i call them into accountability because you can't allow bad behavior just to, to go on and no one addresses it you know we got in trouble over the last few years because all of these manifestations of bad behavior that had gone unchecked for so long. And then when we start pulling their coattails, there's head button going on and all of these things. And we've got to decide how we're going to show up. I remember when we were even starting the race equity network here on Bainbridge and the head budding started. And then we started calling for, for restorative and for healing circles. And then they didn't, they just wanted to keep fighting. They didn't want to come into a place of healing and restoration and being able to hear one another and being able to express how they were feeling. I said, well, how are we ever going to get any place? I remember that very well. Well, and I, yeah, and having actually some pushback about including divisive people in the conversation, because if you don't, how the heck are you going to ever get connected or mend that relationship or create that relationship? That's right. Exactly. Reed, you got your... Uh, well, up. yeah, I, I know uh, this is... Well, I don't want to get all biblical on you, but there's this. <laughs> there's this Go ahead, uh, Reed, get biblical on us. There's this story in the Bible, I think, about... Uh, um, the golden calf about Moses and he's up talking to God, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. people down on the lower part of the <laughs> mountain are deciding they want to move on and, and worship a golden calf. And God refers to them as stiff necked people. <laughs> stiff necks. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's the hard heartedness that you're talking about. It's like, that's if right. we, if we can be aware that's of that kind of feeling in ourselves, you know, when you're getting ready to have an argument, you know it. <laughs> it's like, I'm battening down the hatches here. I'm not opening up my heart. I'm closing my heart. I'm stiffening up my neck because yes. I'm going into battle. And if we can somehow say at that point, well, wait a minute, when you feel that way, let's like take a time out or yes. that's how maybe we can break through. And I don't know. I mean, Akuye has done that in the middle of tension, sort of inviting somebody to think about their stiff neck or their hard heart. Uh, that's a challenge that I hope to yeah. learn to be better at. But Well, and I, you know, I'm thinking about these book conversations. I think that all of us have been a little concerned at times, like, will we meet some solid, some real pushback or will, you know, argumentative situations arise? And that's something I want to really keep in mind is like, the key to turning that argument into a conversation. And as Debbie's pointed out a number of times in different programs, that deep listening is really helpful, but there also comes a time when if somebody's really dominating, you got to cut them off. And, and that's that sort of, uh, I think they used to talk about tough love when I was a kid, right? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> and yes. you know what? I respect your opinion, but the, you know, you're got to share the air here or whatever that um, reminding people to, take mm -hmm. their place and that their place isn't the head of the table necessarily right mm -hmm. um that piece is also part of it's like we have the responsibility to hold the conversation as well as engage in the conversation and that is takes some training i think debbie do you want to speak to that well i just want to speak to i so appreciate that we're using the word heart and you know reed's previous comment in the chat about deconstructing our cultural myths Sometimes, I guess, sometimes I feel, and you know, I've been called woo-woo when I talk about heart or love. And it's such a, like you pointed out, Anne and Akuye, it's such an important piece of this, whether we can use, and I want, to, I want us to be able to use those words. I mean, because if we're talking only from our heads or, you know, other things are going on and our our heart, there's not a little bit of kindness or love or whatever you want to call it in your heart. 
it's going to come off completely different. So yeah, let's talk about heart. Let's talk about love and kindness and, mm-hmm. and, um, and deconstruct our myths that we can't use those languages in, in these sorts of conversations too. So thank you. I think there's a concept that it's very unprofessional mm-hmm. to talk about heart, but excuse me, Rita, you got a comment here. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, Debbie, as you were saying, you want to be able to, we can. We can, yes. We can use those words. Yes. It's up to us to, to use those words and to not back down and say, oh, I'm really sorry. Yes. Because I, I think that when we have our our own feelings and we know what who yes. we are and what our beliefs are, that we're open to that. But if we can present that, we need to stand on who we are and what's right and what is truthful. This, you know, this whole little thing about just like backing off and because you don't want anybody's feelings hurt. <laughs> well, you know, that is not the way life goes. And that, and I think we really need to, I mean, I've gotten my, I've gotten in trouble because I've said what I've said, what is right. And, what is truthful. <laughs> and so I, that is what I think is part of the foundation of what we need to do if we're going to do this work if we're going to do that we that have work. to. So that's, that's what I think that's good. <laughs> that's wonderful. No, that's wonderful, Rita. And I'm glad that you put it just like that. Uh, and I'll just share a little story here. I remember we were going through a lot of conflict And there was a lot of embittered, angry people at the table. And I I asked one of the individuals at the table, could you please forgive me if I have hurt you in any way? If I have hurt you in any way, is it possible? Could you forgive me? Oh, my Lord. Everybody was mad at me because I asked this person that was angry, that that was embittered, if I had done anything to embitter them, would he forgive me? And oh my God, it was like they chopped my head off. I said, oh my goodness, we are not healthy here. We are not healthy when you have those that want to speak about um, if they have offended someone or if there has been a breakdown in the relationship, if there were things that that hurt them or or they, to ask for that forgiveness and for others to be mad that one is asking someone else to please forgive, that is a red flag. And all of the little antennas should have went up in the room that we are not healthy enough to come in the room to even hear one another because we are so angry, we're so hurt, we are so embittered that we can't even speak peacefully to one another. So that was my, that was one of my learned lessons. I said, oh, Lord, we got a lot of work to do. I think again, it's that conception of the love and heart are soft and weak and yeah. you don't want to show any weakness to an enemy. Mm. Right? I mean, I get that sometimes pe- that mm. people have said things like that. And it's like, whoa, first of all, enemy, you know, and second of all, that's not weakness. It's the greatest strength we have. Right. I think there's this huge cultural myth. Again, it's like punk, you know, take D, uh, taking those cultural myths apart and saying, no, I refuse to live in that hardness and I want to use that softening power. Yes, but it yes. doesn't mean that you just say, oh, like what Rita was saying, oh, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings, even though you were saying incredibly unacceptable things. Um, you know, you have to be realistic, right? We have yes. to sort of find our balance of strength and, and hold that truth too, right? Rita's saying water is a great eroder. Does that mean you think I'm a big drip? <laughs> drip by drip we un, un, un uh, we we eat away at the at the cultural myths that we've been living under you know rita speaking up or um akuye saying forgive me if i'm part of the problem in this conversation or 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean for that. I don't mean you're a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. And again, I am so grateful to all of you who participated and come, and most especially Akuye and Debbie for your constant willingness to come forward and help us think about this stuff and talk about this stuff and figure out how we can move forward together. Great. Those are the hugest pieces for our work in this day and age. I mean, it's really obvious. And I don't mean just nationally. I mean, right every day on Bainbridge Island or wherever we are in the county, like this is the work. This is what we're here for. And I'm really grateful for all of you who are companions on this path and teachers. <laughs>